It's my pleasure to be here to discuss with you a topic which I'm very passionate about, which is entrepreneurship, as well as the concept around open source and how we take entrepreneurs from idea to growing company through kind of a, a very uh, complex fabric of methods and ideas and concepts. The talk here is how we can use open collaboration um, locally, nationally, as well as globally. Further, I'd like us to think at the end about how we can catalyze this process and make it so that we can uh, take these ideas and concepts and share them with others. So the concept of open source has its origins um, actually in recipes. So if you've ever shared a recipe, that's an open source concept. But it's been really, uh, uh, have, has had a lot of press recently around open source software. And that's kind of my background, if you heard, is around software technology. The idea is that I can take software, I can publish it online, and I will share that with no cost to others to use, as long as they take that concept, if they modify it or improve it, and submit it back to the community. It's my premise that open source is actually being utilized in communities like ours, and we've used it extensively to build our existing ecosystem from the past to where it is today. So the idea is that you have to have an open mind, be willing to collaborate, um, and you have to have a culture of, of sharing, which I think all those ingredients are here in Blacksburg. So let's look at where we may have been in the past. So in 2002, um, I had a company in the Corporate Research Center called Nanocom that employed 35 people, and um, it had been in the Corporate Research Center for four years. There are a number of great resources in the Corporate Research Center. There was uh, the Business Technology Center, which helped you build a business plan. There's Joe Meredith and his staff. Um, I had actually selected Blacksburg over Raleigh and Northern Virginia to build my company because I viewed this area as having a great quality of life. Um, I also viewed this area as having significant um, value in terms of talent, that the talent at Virginia Tech uh, in terms of students and faculty uh, were second to none in the world. And so I leveraged that talent to build my, to build my company. The RBTC then existed at that time. It was the, the N NCTC, the NUVA Corridor Technology Council. There were about 50 members. So this is how things were in about 2002. Um, and there were two law firms in the area that called themselves Startup Friendly. Um, and I remember the day when the first one came to me and said, Hi, Bob, I'm Startup Friendly. And I thought, OK. This is supposed to be unique, and it actually was. Just to give you an idea of what, how things were in 2002. Um, but I can tell you that something was missing. For me, there was something missing. I felt constrained, um, and I felt that it was, there was a limit to where I could grow, and that definitely did impact my business in terms of the, the model and the path that I was on. So I've departed. Of, newly married in 2005 for Cambridge, Massachusetts, searching for something else. So let's fast forward to today. I'm no longer in Cambridge. I'm in Blacksburg. Um, so I was compelled to come back uh, to our area. I started thinking I'd seen a lot of interesting things in Cambridge. I'd seen some things out in Stanford, Atlanta, other ecosystems. I'd seen in things in Europe and Asia. And started to wonder, what could we do in Blacksburg? What could we learn from these other communities and translate those things to our community? The first place that I looked was with the students. How could, I, I, I thought, if we're going to start anything, it has to be organic. And in fact, what I witnessed at MIT was that the, um, the entrepreneur club, the e-club there, played a critical role in the creation of what is now the premier business plan competition in the world, the MIT 100K. That started in 1986 with a couple of students at MIT with the e-club that decided to give away a few $1,000 prizes focused in on a specific category. So I thought, well, let's see what's at Virginia Tech. And so I Google Virginia Tech entrepreneurs, and I found this group of students in 2007. Um, and I met with them in Pamplin. It was a room of students who had finance majors, accounting majors. Um, there, were, there was no one else from the other parts of the university. 
and I asked them, where, this is the first thing I asked the, 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 the group, where are the engineers? And they kind of thought, and then they laughed. What do we need engineers for? <laughs> and I said, well, let me enlighten you on something. 90% of the entrepreneurs in Blacksburg are engineers. Um, if you want to start a club around entrepreneurship, you need to involve other people. You need to be open. Please think about this concept. Um, so I implored that group of, of students to think about that, and they thought about it, but didn't actually take any action. Um, it took another two years for another group of people to come in to actually accomplish something. In 2009, a group of about 30 of us met in a, on a rainy, dark night in Lytton Reeves where there was a business pitch competition. And there was a, an award which was just basically bragging rights. Um, that has since now graduated uh, to an entrepreneur club with over 600 um, uh, fans on their fan page, and they've given out $10,000 to 10 different teams, uh, student-led teams, for their ideas. Here's an idea. Here, here is, in practice, the concept of open collaboration. When it came down to, to establishing the rules for the VT5K, what did we do? We contacted MIT eClub and said, can we borrow your rules? And they said, yes, you can. Use these rules, modify them how you need. These were very difficult things to come about, and clearly they had built a successful model. So why should we reinvent the wheel? You know, for pride? Of course not. And so that model has been copied, and I would say uh, it's been copied very successfully and has been modified for our, own, for our own sake. Along the way, our students have learned that we can't just be business focused. We need to be cross-university focused. We need to think broadly and widely about how we solve the world's problems. And that's an important change and that's happened through this process. So these, these, these companies, these students, they have these ideas, they get $1,000 to think about starting a business. Now what? Well, that's a good question. Now what? They need money and they need mentors to take those ideas and concepts and grow them onto a global stage. And this is where our local tech council can play a role, and it has played a role. So the RBTC, Roanoke Blacksburg Tech Council, formed the Access to Capital Committee. And with that, what the Access to Capital Committee did uh, first is it created, um, what examined what is going on in the financial fundraising in our region. And it found out that funding was very fragmented. There's certainly not any venture capital. There's angel capital here and there and there. And there's no organizing strategy. So again, uh, we look for models to copy. At an angel capital summit that I attended, I talked to a couple of other angel leaders about this problem. And a group in Seattle said, well, here's what we're doing. We're holding monthly meetings where we bring our angels together and we welcome companies to come pitch. Anyone can come and pitch. And I talked to some others in Boston. I remember that when we were in Cambridge that there were uh, pitch clinics and there were there were pitch sessions and business plan competitions and all these things were happening. And I thought, they're not happening in Blacksburg. What can we do to change that? So the RBTC Pitch and Polish Clinic was founded and it meets now every month. It's helped over 50 companies in the last 24 months. Again, we took a model and we modified it. Um, it involves angel investors as well as um, business strategists or bu uh, respected business leaders in our community. Anyone can come present their business idea for 10 minutes, and then get about 20 minutes of feedback on their concept or idea. And they can come as many times as they like, month to month to month. It usually happens on the third Tuesday of each month. You can go to the technologycouncil.com slash pitch if you're interested in that concept. But over time, companies who've come through Pitch Clinic have raised over $1.5 million. The ones that were most successful came to us over three times. So just the opportunity to practice was important. How hard was that? What did it cost us? It cost us nothing in dollars, but it cost us having an open mind and copying something and bringing it local. So that's, that's open collaboration at work. So out of this as well, the, the companies exit Pitch Clinic and they're looking for funding. Now 460 Angels is, was formed to bring basically what, what had been a loosely, um, loosely connected group of angel investors together under one strategy and again, follow best practice. Many of the angels in the 80s and 90s had been burned they'd, in, in this region. They've been using their, 
kind of their gut instinct to make investments or, or investing on their own diligence. They had no process. Well, the Angel Capital Association is there. It's a national organization, and they provide the templates for which to go through process, to vet deals, to deal source, to, to do diligence. And the most important step is the follow-on process after the investment is made. What do we do after our investment? This is a critical step that many angels in our area had not been really in tune with. Um, because there's a, there's a lot more after investment. So that's what we do with 460 Angels. Now let me talk about TechPad, um, which is my last thing in terms of today. Um, is I was looking for a place to work. And um, I had been in a box. I had been in a, a, an office I was very comfortable in. I could close the door, lock it. Um, very comfortable spot. Um, but I wanted to be in downtown Blacksburg. So I sought some office space, and I found an area above PK's. A friend of mine, Mike Whaley, owns PK's, owns PK's in the office in the building there. And I said, Mike, I'm looking for a place to work. And he said, well, I've got something for you. There's 6,000 square feet above PK's. It hasn't had a tenant in five years. It's in disarray, but you're welcome to go and, and work there. So that, that, pro, that started in October of 2010. And before I knew it, there were people knocking on the door. I want to work here, too. Um, so I started doing something very strange, which I took the layout of 6,000 square feet, which was mostly open. There had been some, some walls that were created, and I started building structure, like all these walls and doors, and I was doing what had been comfortable to me. And then some of the, the students from the Entrepreneur Club and a couple of the other entrepreneurs said, are you crazy? What are you doing to this space? You're blocking out all the natural light. And if you come visit us in TechPad, you'll see there's windows everywhere. It's a beautiful open space. It's built for creative thought thinking. It's very different. Um, I thought, well, I'm just doing what I'm comfortable with, but I'm willing to open my mind and think about being in an open space and collaborating with others and seeing what kind of things can benefit from being there. Because I'd seen these other things occur where uh, we've been borrowing things and being open and sharing, and it worked. So why not translate this into the entire work environment? So TechPad was formed. TechPad is a co-working space. It's 6,000 square feet. It basically operates like a gym membership. A company can come in for $60 a month and just get started on a month-to-month -month basis. And they can increase their level of membership based on their needs. Do they need a fixed desk? Do they need a suite? Do they need two people, three people? And it's flexible on a month-to-month -month basis. Now, again, in the concept of open collaboration and open source, this was not a unique idea. I'd ran across this idea in another place. The Cambridge Innovation Center um, has 250 startups, and it has the same concept. Month-to-month -month, uh, rent, which provides flexibility, and an easy place for someone that has an idea on the napkin to just kind of step off and get moving. So TechPad is that, is, is that space, um, and it has no walls. And I was, though I was uncomfortable at the beginning, um, I've grown to love it. There's been a lot of very interesting interactions because of that open space that would not have occurred otherwise. And TechPad as itself has become this, this vessel, this place where entrepreneurs come and they meet. People email me and say, can I come and talk to TechPad people? Can I, can I learn about what's going on there? TechPadders meet on a monthly basis and do a tech huddle. They share best practice. They share their mistakes. They share the things they've done well. And these are cross-company. So again, we have a dozen companies in there sharing their ideas. Again, open collaboration. I would challenge you to find another place where people on a monthly basis open themselves up and share their mistakes. There's a lot of learning going on there, and that's because of the open space. If I built those walls and did it the way I was going to, none of that would have occurred. So we're going to continue to go down that path. So it's a container and it's still an experiment. I want to un double underline the fact that it's still an experiment. We're still trying to figure out how it runs every day. I've, uh, we've started from the perspective of let's not have many rules. Let's just see where it goes and, and see and let, let our tenants, let our members kind of guide us in the future. So what are the results? The results are right now we have a growing technology council. There are over 250 members of the tech council if you haven't been to a Tech and Toast, they've, on average, there's 120 people that come to a Tech and Toast, a monthly morning meeting where technologists come together, they hear a speaker. Um, 
not in a, in a similar format as this, but with breakfast. Um, 120 people come to that every single month. It's really impressive. That wasn't happening 10 years ago. Um, there are open discussions within the university about entrepreneurship programs, whether they've been minors in entrepreneurship or centers for entrepreneurship. Um, and then we, of course, have to look at our student entrepreneur club, which by many measures is hugely successful. It was ranked in the, it was one of the top entrepreneur clubs in the country. And that happened only when it was one year old in terms of its new, new formation last year. Um, and then there's two other stories I want to talk about, and then we'll wrap up. Is, um, there's an architect in, in TechPad. And he came to TechPad because he had been laid off from his job, and he decided he was going to start a company. And he'd been working out of his house. He's laid off. He wants to start a company, and he cannot draw unemployment benefits, right? Because if he does that, if he draws unemployment benefits, he can't start a company because he's not searching for a job. It's this, it's this really odd scenario. Um, I actually wasn't aware of this, but we had um, the, the chief technology officer of the United States, Anish Chopra, come into TechPad last year and meet with this gentleman. And he shared this problem that he was facing. And Anish looked at him and said, this is ridiculous. We've got to make change. So when Anish left Blacksburg, the first thing he did was he blogged about it, how he'd met this gentleman uh, in Blacksburg who was having this problem. And the next thing he did is he made sure that change was made in legislation. And I'm pleased to announce that two weeks ago, legislation was passed by the federal government, which will now permit the states to provide unemployment benefits to someone who's also starting a company. Right? So here, TechPad was a container that allowed all these things to occur and create federal legislation that will impact millions of unemployed people that might create jobs and entrepreneurs. That's incredible. That happened in Blacksburg. That, became, that happened because of the network that we've built and the container that was there to, to bring all of these things together. It's, it's fascinating. And Anish is no longer the CTO, but is now going to be operating at the state level. And you better believe that the state of Virginia will be one of the first states um, to, to uh, implement these programs. So, and then lastly, in terms of um, uh, results, is that um, I can announce that in two weeks, we'll host a, well, three weeks, we'll host a hackathon here in Blacksburg, the uh, Health, Ho uh, Hokie Health Hackathon, um, that will bring 100 people from around the state to Blacksburg at TechPad. Anish Shoper will speak, Eric Reese, uh, the founder of Lean Startup will speak, and we'll spend 24 hours focused on healthcare IT. And we're going to give away $5,000, a prize from Intel is being awarded for the grand prize, $2,500. $5,000 to six teams for the best ideas in a problem that really needs innovation. There's like three areas of right now that need significant innovation. That's healthcare, energy, and uh, healthcare, energy, and education uh, is the third one. Healthcare is one that is open for entrepreneurs, and that's really cool. And we're going to look at that problem here in Blacksburg, and we'll have some, uh, a lot of press around that. So where do we go next? So here's, here's my vision. Ten years from now, there are 500 people in downtown Blacksburg working in high-tech startups, building products on a global landscape. Um, and really taking this downtown and the connection between the university and the town and corporate to a complete new level. Now, how do we, how do we get there and what, what can we do? So one is you have to know that people are really attracted to coming here. At least on a weekly basis, I hear of someone who is either retiring or relocating that has an inc incredible resume. They're coming back into our region. That's fantastic. We have to attract them and, may, and keep them here. That's everyone's responsibility. Next thing is we need more champions. We need six to ten people that are cheerleading entrepreneurs on a day-to-day -day basis. It's hard work, but it needs to be done. If we're going to have 500 people downtown, we need six to ten champions of entrepreneurship, and that's throughout all the organizations. Um, Virginia Tech, RBTC, Corporate Research Center, everybody, the town included. 
Um, I believe that the rich ecosystem actually starts at Virginia Tech. So the students, the faculty, the entrepreneurship program, all those things start there, again, with the students and faculty. So, and it could be that we need to focus on a competency. So one thing that we're really good at is bootstrapping. It's something that is just built into our DNA. There's not a lot of capital around, so we're really great at bootstrapping. But there are new sources of capital, such as crowdfunding and other ways of getting capital. The venture capital is becoming less geographically centered, and that's really exciting for our region. Uh, but, so we have to be able to create companies that look fantastic to those, uh, to those investors that are in Silicon Valley and Boston and other places where there's large pools of capital. And I'm confident that's happening. It's already, it's already on the way. Um, but what if our competency could be healthcare IT? What if Blacksburg could be the leader in healthcare IT, for example? I'm not sure it is, but we're going to spend a weekend and find out if there's something there. Think about all the resources in all the places on the university, Carillion, medical school, as individuals, as programmers, that we could bring together and be that, like the source of intellectual property for that. So, in closing, let's all celebrate entrepreneurship. Let's all work together to catalyze uh, and, and be open-minded about collaboration. If you see something when you're traveling that you think, this would work great in Blacksburg, bring it here, share it, try to get it moving. And on the, also, if something happens good here, share it to others and it'll come back to you. So together, we can make a big difference and in 10 years, there'll be 500 people in downtown Blacksburg working on products. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Bob, very much for introducing a concept uh, that is very promising for the future of our region, that of the open source village. You can hear Bob in a more in-depth interview on WUVT-FM 90.7 this coming Sunday from 2.30 to 3.30. Uh, so I invite you to tune in to that. Uh, we're going to now go to an interview with Eric Hodges, uh, who is a doctoral student in planning and globalization. And uh, Eric will... Uh, interview Bob and get into some of our topic areas in more depth and then toward the end we'll open up the session to questions and answers from you the audience. Eric? Thanks Andy. Am I on? So we like to call this session our Inside the Actor Studio session. Is anybody here, here familiar with Inside the Actor Studio? I see a few head nods. It was a show that was on Bravo before Project Runway and uh, the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. And basically the actor's studio was an acting school. And the famous host of Inside the Actor's Studio was James Lipton. And James Lipton always had his stack of cards with him. So I made sure to bring my stack of index cards for questions. And he would get celebrities on his show. Paul Newman was his first guest and famous actors and just have sort of a, a, an in-depth conversation with them about their lives and the things that have contributed to their, their acting and career. So we're going to replicate that here with Bob tonight. So Bob, uh, my first question is, we hear this word entrepreneur mentioned a lot. And I think most of us have you know, a sense of what it means to be an entrepreneur. And I'm just curious how you would define entrepreneur. So it's a fairly deep question. It can be answered a number of ways. Uh, but for, for me, I think an entrepreneur uh, fundamentally is someone who can who at first has a vision, so they, they can see uh, what no one else can see. They see the future. They see a point in time that is just crystal clear to them. And so that's the first part of it. And the second element is that they have an uncanny ability to gather resources to get from A to B. So usually there's going to be tremendous barriers. It's not obvious. It's not easy to get from A to B. But they have an ability to convince people who would normally say no way to, okay, um, I'll join your team, I'll invest in your idea, I'll be the first to buy your product. Um, you know, all of these things are very difficult. An entrepreneur has to bring together talent, capital, product, 
you know, sales, marketing, all these things go together. And an entrepreneur um, has that ability, and I think it, that goes across any industry, as well as even within social entrepreneurship. So if you want to, uh, you know, we've been talking a lot about business entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. but I, I think that we also look at the other kind of entrepreneur, which is a social entrepreneur, someone who decide, who, who looks at what are the problems that people are facing regarding poverty? You know, what are the, what are, how are we going to get, you know, the right kinds of medical supplies to people who are in need? Who's going to solve the big social problems, which are uh, extremely important to to our growth as a society. And so um, they, they face the same kind of problems. Create a nonprofit startup. I mean, you have to raise money, gather people, right. get them around your vision. You yeah. know, we can solve hunger in, you know, in our county. Right. You know, there are hungry mothers in Pulaski. I want to solve that problem. That actually feeds right into my second question. Of course it does. I hope you guys have some time because I have lots of questions here. Yeah, I see this. No. Okay, so I think the things that you've been doing with TechPad and, and what you've talked about as far as entrepreneurship is really great. It's a really great model for creating these open source communities and sort of breaking down barriers in a lot of way. But my question is how can you use this model of entrepreneurship to solve some of the problems that we're facing as a community? How can you use the model that you have to solve some of these bigger problems that you were mentioning that we're facing? Yeah, so I th you know, fundamentally, these, all of these problems require collaboration and strategic partnerships, and they do require a number of leaders and people right. to come together. And, I mean, uh, to create a plan that says I can get from A to B. You know, this is a very entrepreneurial kind of leader type of activity. Right. Um, and they can be, I think, applied universally to these other categories. Mm -hmm. If you look at people who have been successful um, in, in the social uh, realm, I think you'll find all of those qualities. Um, that fundamentally, you have to be open-oriented. You're going to borrow best practice, and you're going to share your best practice with others. Yeah, that's, that's great. I mean, I think, um, which sort of leads into my next question about obstacles. You know, what, what are the obstacles to this? being more open because it seems like we do have, uh, we like to be in our silos in a lot of ways in, in a lot of the arenas that, that we work in and live in. So how do, we, how do we convince people that it's okay to sort of, you know, let go a little bit and have this sort of uh, cooperative mentality? Yeah, I think there's some people that will never, uh, you can never convince certain people to be open. They're just going right. to be in, set in their ways. But I'll have to admit that for myself, I was very you know, somewhat closed-minded two years ago about many ideas, and the way that I went through it is that it was shown to me. And I was at least open-minded to try. Right. You know, I, I mentioned the example of building the walls in TechPad. You know, I very much wanted to build out those walls. I got a CAD program. I had it all laid out. I knew what the square footage per room was, where the doors were going to be. Right. Um, and someone that I respected, a student, said, hey, why are you going to build those things? Right. And it, it, it also fit into the realm of, you know, it was actually a lot more effort, if you think about it, for me to have to construct all those walls. Yeah, that's a good point. Think about the dollars involved in that. And so to make change, it, it, it meant, well, we can actually make an incremental change to what we have. Right. And that also meant changing my mind. So I was able to be open-minded through the perspective of, hey, this is actually an easier path. Right. So maybe that can work in other scenarios. As you have to be creative right. as the change agent to convince the, the siloed individual that, hey, it can actually be less work, less energy for you if you go this other way. Because of new technology or something, it's actually 10x less effort, and you can get more efficiency. Have you noticed any sort of organizational problems that come up? Because I, I think one of the, the common counter arguments you'll hear to sort of having a a more flat structure and a more open structure is that, you know, it may not function as efficiently without this hierarchy of sort of, you know, this person is my supervisor. Um, so have you run into any organizational problems like that at all, or institutional problems by having a more open community? I think, I think that the, the jury is probably still out on that. It'll take time before we know. Um, at some levels, see, the companies in TechPad are fairly small, so they operate right. independently. The benefit is that a company of two or three or even one um, 
operates within the, the same knowledge scope of 30. So they benefit from the group think. Um, consider the, the architect that I was talking about, that if he were to go into an office space that wasn't TechPad, when he goes to work every day, he's by himself. He's not interacting with other people. He's not getting that kind of mental stimulation that he might get within TechPad. That actually applies to me. That's the way I viewed it. It's like, I don't want to be by myself. Right. You know, I know that I am a better person being challenged by others right. and seeing their activity. Now, am I head down, face, you know, working on something? No, but honestly, that's not what I want my life to be about. You know, right. it's more I enjoy those connections with, the, with other individuals. I'm talking about distractions, like where right. there could be distraction in, in an open space. Mm -hmm. I think um, are significantly outweighed by the benefits of the unintended conversations or right. the ideas that come from open free flow. Sort of the coffee shop mentality in some ways. It's, it's mean, the open water cooler of right. you know, tech space. You know, and, right. so. and there's been a lot of ideas. I mean, I know uh, for that there are cases where people have saved themselves several months of energy because someone overheard a conversation. Right. Oh, you're thinking about authenticating with Facebook? Oh, well, this is the problem that we had. Right. Or you're thinking about using that kind of database? Oh, watch out for this pitfall. You know, these kinds of things don't happen if everyone's closed up in their own boxes. I think, I think that's fantastic. And I, just, I think it would be really great if we could use a model like that in other sectors in our own lives. You know, for governance is a perfect example. You know, if we could have a more sort of democratic, you know, direct democratic governance structure where we had an open space like that where citizens could go and sit and discuss these ideas and, and sort of learn from each other. So do you think that this type of model could be exported into like a governance type structure? So I'm not sure about governance, but I can tell you that um, the, the Virginia Tech library system is undergoing some changes. Mm -hmm. And they, um, their leadership um, approached TechPad and said, we like what's going on here. How can we model this in the university setting? Great. Would it be possible to take out, you know, these 30,000 books, stacks of books, and replace it with collaborative spaces where there's cross-functional teams? What would that look like if we co-taught or co-learned in, a, in, a, in, a, in an open space? Right. So you, on, you, you purposely put a College of Science, College of Business, College of Engineering class taught at the same time, or at least their project collaborations were occurring at the same time. And they're absolutely borrowing and looking at what's happening in a tech pad and other co-working spaces, saying, how can we learn from that and apply it within? Right. And it'll be fun to see how it works out. I don't, I don't, it's a grand experiment. That's great. We had a, another thing we do with Community Voices is we have a roundtable discussion with graduate students. And uh, we had a roundtable earlier today with Bob. And one of the things I found really interesting was the concept of social entrepreneurship. And we're talking about sort of this distinction between the amount of social entrepreneurship that you see in the uh, MIT 100K versus sort of the Virginia Tech uh, 5K. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and maybe why you think that, that it's the case that there's that disparity. So specifically in the Boston arena, in that culture, there is a lot more awareness of social entrepreneurship. So the MIT 100K is, is two prizes. There's $50,000 that goes into social entrepreneurship, and the other 50 is for, for, for enterprise, for business. Um, the first year that the Virginia Tech 5K was run, there was a social entrepreneurship category. Right. And what happened is that we got students submitting for social software. So even though the title said social entrepreneurship, right. the students read that as, oh, this is where I put my Facebook application. Right. Um, and so subsequently, that category was eliminated. Um, but it would, be, it would be fantastic to see that come back. Sure. Um, would love to see a concerted effort to, it's probably an educational element. It's a matter of just everyone getting behind the concept. Right. Uh, and I know there are a lot of people here that care about these topics. And through the lens of entrepreneurship, there may be a path to um, solving some of these problems and getting around it. Okay. And, and, and modeling after what's going on in the business side. Okay, we can take exactly that model and we can build nonprofit businesses. Right. Uh, they, have to be, they have to be sustainable in the long run, which mm -hmm. means
profitable at some level, right. Right. usually measured not in terms of dollars, but in terms of job creation or less people hungry or wh whatever the metric is that they're trying to solve. Sure. Um, but those are absolute uh, lenses, and there's, there's significant capital from all the major foundations. Right. But you have to talk that language and understand that, those models. Okay. Well, those of you that have seen the Inside the Actor Studio know that James Lipton can't end one of his interviews without doing his famous questionnaire that was made popular by a French uh, journalist named Bernard Pivot. So I thought I would end our interview section by asking you some of these questions from Lipton's questionnaire. Fantastic. All right. It's a little more lighthearted here. Excellent. So, Bob, what is your favorite word? My favorite word? Motivation. Motivation. That's a good one. What is your least favorite word? Hate. Hate. What turns you on? I know, I know your wife is in the audience, so... Uh... Inspiration. That's, that's great. What turns you off? Um, fear. Fear. Yeah. What sound or noise do you love? <laughs> um, I don't know. Okay, no, that's, that's, that that's fair. What sound or noise do you hate? Uh, a crying baby at 5.30 <laughs> in the morning. <laughs> that one. I, uh, I think we have some uh, youngsters in the audience, so I'm not going to ask you what your favorite curse word is, but that's one of his we'll questions. One. Yeah, we'll skip that one. Uh, so what profession other than yours would you like to pursue? If you weren't an entrepreneur, what would you like to be doing? Uh, race car driving. Okay, yeah. cool. Any particular kind, NASCAR, Formula One? Formula One, I think, would be fun. I love, I love fast cars. Okay. Uh, likewise, which profession would you not like to have? I would not want to be a doctor. Why, why not? I can't handle blood or anything. Like Sign of that stuff, i got a weak stomach. <laughs> All right, last question. That one. So if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say to you as you enter the pearly gates? Welcome, my son. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> well, thanks for indulging me on that, Bob. <laughs> okay. Pleasure. So now at this point, we're going to open up the questions to the audience. So if, if somebody has a question, please raise your hand. And we have a couple of ushers who are going to run the mics up to you. And uh, I will direct the ushers to you guys. So at this point, I'll open it up to you. Yep. Guy in the middle right back here. White shirt. Yep. Bob, thank you. Uh, thank you for your, your time. It's been a great presentation. Uh, my name is Derek McGard. Uh, I spent some time in Utah, and uh, they had some similar issues that they're trying to address that you've brought forward, uh, some situations that we face here in Blacksburg. And uh, one of the approaches that they took uh, to really spawn innovation and, and technology out west was to, uh, to really get the communities, local governments, and state governments involved, and to get them invested in some of this technology. And uh, they created a fund of funds and uh, allowed uh, a panel to look at new technologies and to invest in them with, uh, you know, if you will, uh, taxpayer money and also some private donations. And uh, in 2010, uh, 2009, I apologize, uh, University of Utah was 17th in the nation for business spinouts. In 2010, they beat MIT for, for number one for business spinouts. How do you, could, could you see something like that happening here in Virginia and the, the state to recognize the talent and the potential we have in this area, in this region, and create a fund of funds or, or some type of program like Utah did to, uh, to really spawn uh, th this, this innovation, this technology, and to, to invest in, in some of these smaller companies? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. There, other ecosystems have had a significant um, success in utilizing capital to kind of align all the resources. Um, and the state of Virginia has been increasing its uh, allocations in this space. So the, the Center for Innovative Technology, CIT, 
uh, last year went from a $1 million fund to a $6 million fund. They had to spend in one year. And we're absolutely seeing more traction in terms of that capital coming to our area, as well as we're seeing those people, their faces here more often, uh, looking for things. Um, and they're, you know, they're, there's a lot of things that come from that capital. I would absolutely love to see more of that happen. I'd like to see you know, that funding allocation be renewed or have some kind of long-term sustainable element to it. You know, unfortunately, that group will be you know, having to go to the state legislature again and proving like, we need this money um, and show with the benefits of it. So I, I know that they'll do a great job. They've got a tremendous job to spend that money wisely. Think about your taxpayer dollars going into startups, of which most of them are going to fail. Um, but hopefully many will not. And so, you know, we have to do our part in that, which is make sure that those organizations are aware of those ideas and that our entrepreneurs are aware that those funds are there. So uh, from the CIT perspective, I'll just tell you that uh, uh, if you have a concept that has some technology oriented, it doesn't have to be university related, CIT will give you a $50,000 non-dilutive debt uh, investment right now for your concept. And it's a very quick process. This was just announced a few weeks ago. And then th the next round, they'll go up to $200,000, and they like to co-invest. But that's real money to get from a concept into a, uh, a prototype or in the market. Um, but there still needs to, there's still gaps in funding in terms of what do you do after that 200K, um, et cetera. But funds are one way to do it, for sure. Other questions? Uh, Bob, I'd like to thank you for your presentation. That was uh, terrific. I'd also like to thank the uh, folks that put on Community Voices. This is, uh, this is wonderful. Um, you know, I, I'm Tom Sanchez. I'm a professor at Virginia Tech. And I wanted to ask you a question about your 10-year vision or actually challenge that. Um, should Virginia Tech be here in 10 years? <clears throat> We've seen lots of trends in open, open access, open source, uh, uh, distance learning related to technology, should we limit ourselves geographically to just being in Blacksburg? Shouldn't we be everywhere if we have a quality project? Yeah, or product? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, I mentioned that there's three categories. I mean, this is where investors are looking right now. The big categories for disruption are, and I stumbled on education, but it was the one that I, of the three, I feel is probably the most important. Um, but Virginia Tech will have to find its way to be a leader in the new landscape. And, and this will probably happen in 10 years. You know, the, the quality of the education, the content that's being taught here is the same, if not better, than perhaps MIT, Stanford, any other university. Um, but how do we make it so that, the, that that is taught in a more efficient way? I mean, education is still delivered the same way it was 100 years ago. And that has to change. Because economically, we cannot afford it. There has to be efficiencies, and technology is the way that we create those efficiencies. Um, I would have to say that Virginia Tech is a leader in this category uh, in terms of many of its electronic initiatives. So it will have to maintain that leadership because it will to sustain itself in the long run. Uh, the great thing is there could be, as we do this health IT codathon, I think it would be interesting to perhaps next year choose another category such as education. Why not offer a challenge to faculty and students to apply their, their, their knowledge and their skill at education? So what if Virginia, what if the competency is education IT? That's, that's what we're good at because we have great developers, entrepreneurs, a world-class university that already has global connectivity. Um, and we're on Lambda Rail in terms of, of broadband. So, I mean, that we have a leg up on, in terms of our competitors. There's a competitive analysis, right, of Virginia Tech versus others. Um, so maybe that's a path. It would be to challenge people. How can we lead this educational disruption that's going to occur? Let's not get left in the dust. Yep. Gentleman right here. Thank you. You just mentioned Virginia Tech being on National Lambda Rail, which talks about uh, broadband and technology infrastructure required to support the sorts of educational changes you speak about. 
If we're going to have 500 entrepreneurial companies, high-tech companies in Blacksburg, what sorts of infrastructure is the town going to need? I love that question. <laughs> uh, Any time that I meet um, town council members or other people from the town, I ask for two things, parking and broadband. These are the two things that are critical resources. That if I were to have, six, we were just discussing this yesterday with another entrepreneur, if we had 60 people that wanted to work downtown tomorrow, I would have no place to put them, their cars. And I certainly, I'd be on the edge of being able to provide them uh, top tier broadband capacity. So honestly, the, the broadband element is lesser of an issue in terms of it can be solved with financial. Like we've looked at a number of proposals that will bring fiber into TechPad. There is a fiber ring that the town is invested in. Um, so that side of things is happening, maybe slower than we, we would all like to, um, uh, to happen. Um, and on the parking side, I'm encouraged that there's discussion of a parking deck um, on the back side on Progress Street that could also help with that issue. Um, but it's going to be a challenge. So I, I'm a huge proponent of broadband capacity. Um, I might not be in Blacksburg if it weren't for the Blacksburg Electronic Village, which I used in 1994 for $30 a month. I had high-speed capacity that connected me to my job in Northern Virginia. So um, you know, we need to invest in that infrastructure for it to be possible. Chris? Uh, why more uh, parking spaces? Why not a better public transportation system so we can have a smaller footprint? Yeah, I, I would love if everyone took the bus and rode their bikes, and some people do at TechPad. You know, parking is actually a, an optional element, so we would love people to carpool and use mass transit. The reality is that we live in a um, kind of a fairly distributed geographic space where it's you know, people live in Giles County, people live in Pulaski, and they drive in. They have cars, and they, they have needs to, like, drop off their kids at school and do all these other things, and they need to park. Um, so perhaps there's another challenge there for, for someone to solve. But the reality is people need their cars right now, at least in this town. We have time for one more question, I think. Is there anybody on this side of the room that would like to ask a question? I want right to be fair. Yeah. Go ahead. So, um, sorry. You already got the mic. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so I feel like technology is kind of the centerpiece for entrepreneurship right now. But is there anything that isn't technological based that um, you're particularly, ex <clears throat> excuse me, excited for at the moment? So we talked. We talked a lot about uh, social entrepreneurship, and that doesn't necessarily involve. Um, technology. It usually will involve um, organizational structure or uh, lots of governance and policy issues to solve these kinds of issues. Um, reality is that technology is an enabler in terms of it's a force of change. It forces change. It creates efficiency. So technology is usually going to play a role in something that's disruptive. And if you're an entrepreneur, you're looking for things that are in the middle of disruption. This means big opportunities. You don't want to be fishing in a tiny small pond where there's only 10 customers. You want to be looking at a big ocean of opportunity where there's millions of people flooding in and you've got the thing um, or the, the product or service or it could be a business model. There, there's lots of ways. But usually technology is going to be some kind of enabler. It doesn't have to be software technology. There's lots of types of technologies. All right, well, I just want to thank you guys for your questions and uh, coming out tonight and being a part of our Community Voices experience. Thank you so much, Bob, for being here. Really thank you for having me. It.